Hello and a very warm welcome to Breakfast News on Rajya Sabha TV. I'm Tina Jha. Let's begin with a look at the top stories of the day. Big boost to India's fight against black money as G20 endorses a global initiative to stamp out tax evasion. Agreement signed on sharing bank account information. Protests for urgent action on climate change in over 2,000 locations worldwide ahead of a UN climate summit next week. Afghanistan's presidential contender signed a power-sharing agreement. Drawn-out political standoff ends, setting the stage for US troop commitment passed this year. Islamic State militants in Syria move towards capturing a key Syrian border town, forcing tens of thousands to flee into neighbouring Turkey. Massive refugee crisis grows. And at the Indonesian Games, medal hopes for India in the shooting and squash events on the third day today. India has three medals so far and ranks 10th in the medal stand. Our top story this morning, India may soon get access to details of black money stash abroad. G20 countries have agreed to start exchanging tax information automatically in an effort to erode global tax evasion. From 2017, information will be exchanged under that common standard to send a strong deterrence message against tax cheats. Here's a report. We have endorsed far-reaching initiatives which will arm our tax authorities with the information they need to identify tax evaders through the automatic exchange of information using a common reporting standard. We agreed to begin exchanging information through use of the CRS commencing from 2017. This G20 <coughs> initiative could be a major gain for Indian authorities trying to recover black money stashed abroad or at least find out the names of those who have evaded tax by amassing wealth in foreign banks. For governments around the world, the move will be the latest success in the fight against illicit wealth. It will also help India secure information that several countries were earlier denying, citing local secrecy laws. And this will send a strong deterrence message to tax cheats with immediate effect. We're urging other jurisdictions, particularly financial centres, to match our commitment. 45 countries, including India, Mauritius and Switzerland, are likely to be early adopters of the deal. The deal will allow automatic exchange of bank information by countries, including bank balance and income during a year. Countries may also access older data on request. This is about making it possible for the system to talk to itself. And therefore, that, as Treasurer said, no place to hide for the case of uh, individuals who want to go to a, a tax haven in order not to pay taxes. In May this year, the NDA government decided to set up a special investigative team to probe black money. According to information shared by the government in parliament during last session, the total deposit of Indians in Swiss banks was over 14,000 crore rupees by the end of 2013. However, the Swiss bank had informed it does not have a list of names. Bureau report, Raj Sabha TV. And to discuss more on how that deal is going to work, we have with us this morning Mr. Alok Bansal, Executive Director at the South Asian Institute for Strategic Affairs. A very good morning and welcome to Rajya Sabha TV, Mr. Bansal. The deal on sharing bank information looks as a major boost to India's effort to bring back the black money that's stashed abroad. But for you, what's the most important takeaway? What's the, will, it be as, uh, will it act as a deterrent for tax evaders yeah. in India? I think uh, the most significant factor is that it will act as a test, uh, deterrence for tax evaders because it will come into uh, being from 2017 when 45 major countries are coming into its ambit, mm. primarily from India's point of view, two important countries that is Mauritius and Switzerland uh, would start sharing data with India. But the most significant part is that you can also get older data on a request right. because otherwise what would have happened is that uh, people would have probably shifted, people may, might have migrated, shifted their accounts from these uh, banks, closed down or things like that. But now since that facility is available, uh, the cases where these prosecutions etc are going where there are certain suspicions about black money and things like that, the government of India could request for data from these countries. What is more significantly, in future, 
it will act as a huge deterrence because the data will be available online, at mm -hmm. least within the countries, uh, within these countries. And by 2018, 100 plus countries are, in addition, expected to join in these 45 countries. And that will be a huge deterrence. With such a large number of countries part of that deal, how feasible is this agreement going to be? How, how, what are the ways in which it's going to work? What are the drawbacks that will fall in place as we enter 2017? See, one thing one must understand that there will be huge amount of data. And uh, unless, of course, you have some inputs about an individual or things like that, it will be difficult to actually investigate. It will be like an ocean of data available right. and you will have to focus on individuals or particulars that you would need because uh, obviously I don't know what all, as of now what they are saying is that they will be sharing the balance detail mm. and the income that they have accrued on those accounts during that particular period. Yeah. So these are the two crucial figures as far as tax is concerned. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to dig into a person, you'll have to send a request for a particular account that we would like to have the past data itself. But uh, you must understand that this is a very, very significant achievement because in the global banking system, you have various uh, tax havens where the whole economy to a very great extent mm -hmm. was thriving on this so-called secrecy laws. Now, the fact that these countries have agreed to come on board and share these data is a very, very significant achievement. Mm -hmm. Of course, the process would probably require fine-tuning subsequently at a later date. Maybe you may, well, once you have certain experience and expertise in operating this, sharing this data, mm -hmm. you may want some additional information. Obviously, and, and, a, and a significant achievement for the Indian government as well, because as you remember, it was part of the BJP's poll manifesto before it headed into the Lok Sabha elections. Mr. Bansal, do stay with us. We'll come back to you in just a bit. Now, moving on to Afghanistan, where the country has a unity government with the two presidential contenders finally agreeing on a power-sharing deal. The U.S. had termed this a decisive move towards a closure to Afghanistan's political crisis ahead of troop withdrawals from the troubled nation. Take a look at this report. A hug and a handshake capped the end of a political deadlock in Afghanistan. Rival candidates signed a power-sharing agreement to install a new president and a new government of national unity. The deal that was signed in a televised ceremony at the presidential palace hosted by outgoing President Hamid Karzai allows Ashraf Ghani to become president while runner-up Abdullah or someone he appoints will be the Prime Minister. <laughs> The deal comes after an UN-monitored audit of all 8 million ballots cast in a June runoff vote that was disputed by both major candidates. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry brokered the audit. The U.S. welcomed the deal as an important opportunity for unity. The presidential elections in Afghanistan, the first democratic transfer of power in the nation's history, had raised hopes for a smooth transition from Karzai, who has ruled since the Taliban were defeated in late 2001. But now, after a bitter election campaign and months of wrangling, the stability of the new government will depend on how long will the rivals be able to maintain the union. Bureau report, Raja Sabha TV. All right, so Mr. Bansal, what do you think? Is this unity government in Afghanistan going to end the political crisis? Yes, at least temporarily, yes. And in fact, it's a big achievement. I think uh, the U.S. backroom maneuvering has actually brought the two warring factions, the two warring candidates on board. And uh, you must understand, in the history, entire history of Afghanistan, this is actually the first time mm -hmm. when one leader would make way for another through the ballot. In Afghanistan's history, it has never happened, mm -hmm. uh, of course. Uh, so it's a very, very big achievement. But the big question that arises is this tricky balance of power between both these rivals. So the, the uncertainty is, for how long is this deal going to stay? I have no doubts that there will be bickering, of course. You have two warring uh, candidates coming up. Uh, 
But the good thing I found was that it doesn't say that Abdullah Abdullah would be the CEO. He could as well be the CEO, but the choice is left for him to nominate a suitable mm. candidate. Uh, I don't know, I may be wrong, but I guess that Abdullah would want to nominate somebody from his camp rather than becoming himself a CEO okay. and in that way being an, uh, in a junior position to Ashraf Ghani. Mm -hmm. So he would possibly want one of his candidates to be CEO. Uh, and uh, to my mind, for a country like Afghanistan, the amendments that are proposed, the changes that are to be brought into constitution where power will be shared, is I think more suitable mm -hmm. than one man wielding all the power. Right. And I think uh, it requires uh, the maturity of both uh, the main contenders uh, to make this system work. But what is important is that Afghanistan for foreseeable future would still be dependent on foreign aid. Exactly. And mm -hmm. uh, like now, mm -hmm. I think uh, the countries which are delivering on this foreign aid, primarily the United mm -hmm. States of America, would still have the power to nudge the two uh, warring factions mm -hmm. together. And I think if it works for a certain period of time, it's actually the first two years which are crucial, mm -hmm. till the constitutional amendments come into being and the post of prime minister is created. Mm -hmm. Once that is created, then you will have a constitutional framework. To and obviously on. huge challenges, both in terms of economy as well as security, because the NATO troops withdraw by the end of this year. See, security point of view, I feel it's a more important factor because economy will inevitably improve if the security situation is mm -hmm. good. And from the security front, there are two positives. The first is, of course, Ashraf Ghani, the moment he takes over, now he will sign the bilateral security arrangement. Certainly, and certainly. you will have a token US presence. Mm. And in a country like Afghanistan, it makes a huge psychological impact. Because uh, till now, the Taliban have been propagating that you may have the watches, but we have the time. That means we, they were really fighting to outlast the Americans. But now once they know that there will be a token presence, and that will enable the foreigners to build up forces expeditiously, mm -hmm. should the need arise. Now that would be a huge psychological impact because in Afghanistan's history, if you look, most of the victories have been achieved because the fence sitters have crossed over. Right. Now with this sort of assurance being there, mm -hmm. that there is, yes, there is a external support, the US is there to mm -hmm. underwrite this government, uh, that uh, crossing over will not take mm -hmm. place. And the second factor is that because of this democratic transitions, the more and more Afghans will realize that it is possible to change the government democratically. Mm. Though I wish this bickering of past few days would not have been there, then it would have been an even more uh, credible right, uh, right. Uh, belief. Mm -hmm. But with that, and with the Americans moving out of the public glare, mm. I think the main uh, grouse on which they were drawing people, that is there is a foreign occupation, will probably vanish. And then I think uh, the Taliban will slowly start mm -hmm. losing Face. Right, but a huge challenge there for this ruling coalition, the rival coalition. It will be interesting to see in our neighbourhood. Thank you, Mr. Bansal, for joining us this morning and sharing those vital details. With that, we'll slip into a very short break here. Still to come, the curfew in Sierra Leone against Ebola is to be lifted. Authorities call the lockdown a success. That and much more still to come on the other side. Do stay tuned. Welcome back. You're watching Breakfast News. Now, flood ravaged Jammu and Kashmir has started to uphill task to rebuild and rehabilitate. Scarcity of drinking water is still a major problem in the valley. The rescue teams are busy to restore road links to send victims back home. But a lot remains to be done in the post-flood scenario. After a fortnight of flood nightmares, People in Jammu and Kashmir are slowly returning to what once was their home. Ravaged by overflowing waters from River Jhelum, some of the houses are barely standing. While victims try to settle down, the scarcity of water has become a major concern. Receding flood water in Srinagar has left behind a trail of destruction. The streets of Srinagar look like garbage, strewn of dead animals, belongings and other floating debris, rotting away, raising fears of waterborne diseases. It remains one of the biggest challenges for the authority to clean it up. Health services in the state have also been badly hit by the floods. pumping is the most carcasses 
जो पड़े हैं उनको वहां से हटाना है ताकि ये पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ डिजीज ये कर्ब की जाए एंड सबसे पहले अस्पताल जो पानी में घिरे हुए हैं उनको ऑपरेशनल करना बहुत बहुत जरूरी है स्पेशल व्हीकल्स हैव बीन ब्रॉट इन बाय द एनडीआरएफ टू ऑपरेट इन द फ्लड अफेक्टेड रीजंस व्हाट वी हैव डन वी बॉट दिस ऑल टेरेन व्हीकल्स द पर्पस इज टू टेस्ट द टेक्नोलॉजी वेयर दीस व्हीकल्स कैन नेगोशिएट सर्टेन एरियाज वेयर कन्वेंशनल व्हीकल्स आर नॉट एबल टू गो Severely affected by the floods, migrant labourers have been leaving the valley in large numbers. Their exodus will affect the reconstruction in the valley, which may take months. With winters due to set in soon, victims are looking for more help. With inputs from Ravindra Sharan, Bureau Report, Raj Sabha TV. Thousands of people rallied across the world on Sunday, demanding more action from against demanding more action against climate change. The mass rallies come ahead of the UN climate summit in New York that gets underway tomorrow. Hundreds of thousands of protesters marched in more than 2,000 locations worldwide. Demonstrations demonstrators said the mobilization is aimed at transforming climate change from an environmental concern to an everybody issue. Campaigns were also held for curbs on carbon emissions in Manhattan. Over three lakh people joined a march that was also attended by UN Chief Ban Ki Moon. Huge demonstrations also took place in Australia and Europe. We have a very unique, we're at a very unique point in history in which we can actually tackle this problem right now and get ahead of it rather than wait another 15 years and uh, let it let it overtake us. I've been pretty rubbish about being green in my own life, but I, I'm now certain that this is a very real threat to our own survival, and um, that we are blindly ignoring it at our peril. And more than 66,000 Syrian refugees have fled into Turkey in the last 24 hours as Islamic State militants there tightened their grip on the Syrian border towns. Turkish troops closed down on Syrian refugees following a huge influx. Turkish security forces fired water cannons and tear gas at crowds which had gathered in support of Syrian Kurdish refugees on the border. Earlier on Friday, Turkey had opened its border to Syrians fleeing the town of Kobane. Kurdish residents fleeing the frontier town of Kobani and its surrounding villages said that the militants were executing people of all ages in the areas they had seized. The United Nations has termed the refugee influx the most severe crisis since the war began. The latest information is that it's estimated that there are well over 70,000 people who have crossed. It's just about a day and a half now. Uh, these crossings began on Friday. Not everyone has been registered yet. It may even be over a hundred thousand people. Meanwhile, in Iraq, the wife of a British taxi driver, being held hostage by the Islamic State jihadists on Sunday, implored his captors to release him. An aid worker, Alan Henning, was captured ten months ago and shown in the same video released a week ago that documented the gruesome murder of fellow Briton David Haynes. Days after the Islamic State released a video showing killing of Briton David Haynes, the wife of another hostage, Alan Henning, pleaded with the militants to release him. The appeal comes a day after two high-profile imams in the UK called for his release. Alan Henning, a taxi driver, was seized while on an aid mission to Syria last December. IS has so far released the footage showing the killing of two American journalists. And a British journalist and hostage, John Cantley, speaking directly to the camera and promising to reveal what he called the truth about the Islamic State. Meanwhile, Kurdish fighters are scrambling to defend the stronghold of Kobani in northern Syria after many thousands fled after an offensive by IS. Hundreds of people gathered in solidarity for a third day on the Turkish side of the border near the town of Suruk. Officials say close to 66,000 refugees have crossed into Turkey in 24 hours. Earlier, Islamic State militants released 46 Turkish hostages from Iraq, but the country's president said no ransom was paid. Bazı koalisyon taleplerine, tekliflerine o anda hemen ne demek? Tabii biz de varız denilebilirdi işte. Dünyanın devleri bir arada işte beraber onu da yapalım, bunu da yapalım diyorlar. Ama biz hemen bu işe evet diyemezdik çünkü bizim 49 canımız var. Bizim için bunlar hallolmadan. The United States has launched several airstrikes against the IS fighters. 30 countries have pledged to join the U.S. coalition against the militants, 
But Turkey said it will only allow humanitarian and logistical operations from a NATO airbase on its soil. Bureau report, Raja Sabha TV. And on now to some other news and updates from around the world in the World Wrap. A three-day curfew aimed at containing the Ebola outbreak in Sierra Leone has been declared a success by the authorities. The wide-ranging curfew ended at midnight on Sunday. The curfew in Sierra Leone came into force on Friday morning, with most of the country's 6 million inhabitants confined to their homes. Around 30,000 medical volunteers travelled to affected neighbourhoods to find and treat patients and distribute soap. Sierra Leone has been one of the worst affected countries by the outbreaks with more than 550 victims among the 26,000 deaths, 2,600 deaths so far recorded. Tens of thousands of Russians rallied in Moscow in protest against the armed conflict in eastern Ukraine in the first major anti-war rally since the standoff began between Kiev and pro-Russian rebels last year. People carrying Russian and Ukrainian flags chanted no to war and stop lying. Similar rallies took place in St. Petersburg and other Russian cities. A truce between Ukrainian forces and pro-Russian rebels was agreed on 5th September, but there have been repeated violations since then. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry held a rare face-to-face -face meeting with Iran's Foreign Minister Mohammad Javad Zarif in New York, saying there is an opportunity for progress on the nuclear talks. Both are in New York for this week's UN General Assembly. They are also reported to have discussed the threat posed by the Islamic State militants in Syria and Iraq. Forty migrants are missing after a raft carrying them sank around 49 kilometers from eastern Libya. Italian authorities sent boats to the scene and 55 people have been rescued, but survivors said there were around 95 people in total on the raft. This is the second tragedy of this kind in the last 10 days, as more than 500 migrants are believed to have died after traffickers rammed their ship off Malta's coast last week. Fiji's Prime Minister Frank Bainarama has claimed victory in the country's first democratic elections in eight years. The 60-year-old ruler, a former naval officer who has twice seized power in Fiji via military coups, has been Prime Minister of Fiji since 2007. We'll take another short break here. All the news from the ancient Asian games coming up on the other side. Do stay with us. Welcome back, you're watching Breakfast News. And now let's get you all the updates from the Inchon Asian Games in a quick wrap. Indian shooters continue to shine as they clinch the bronze medal in men's 10 meters air pistol team event, narrowly missing on the silver medal. India and China were level on points and the silver was decided by the number of bullseyes in which China tallied one more than India. Jitu Rai finished fifth in the singles event. India's women's badminton team went down to host South Korea 1-3 in the women's team badminton semi-finals to settle for their maiden bronze medal at the Asian Games. Saira Nehwal gave India a 1-0 lead, but the Indians lost their next three matches to go down to formidable opponents. This was India's first medal in badminton since the team won bronze by the men in Seoul in 1986. The Indian men's hockey team started its campaign on a rousing note by thrashing Sri Lanka 8-0. In the new 60-minute format, Rupinder Pal Singh scored a hat-trick, while Ramandeep Singh chipped in with two goals in the drubbing of the minnows. India will next play Oman on Tuesday. India will be looking to get past the semis after being assured of a bronze medal in both men's and women's singles squash event. In the men's semi-finals, Saurabh Ghoshal will take on Malaysia's Ong B. Benghi, while in women's semi-finals, Deepika Palikal will play Nicole David Ann. Deepika had won the quarter-final against her compatriot Joshna Chinappa. Indian shooters will look to add more medals on the third day as the women's shooters will compete in the 10 meters air rifle and 25 meters pistol team event as well as in the individual event. All eyes will now be on the world number one Hina Sidhu in the 25 meters pistol event. And here's a look at the medal tally on day two of the Asian Games. Oh, South Korea are at the top of the table with 12 goals. China have equal number of goals but are second with one silver less than South Korea. 
Japan are in at the third place with seven gold medals. India is at the tenth position at the moment with one gold medal and three bronze medals. One of the world's largest, rowdiest and most famous beer festivals, Oktoberfest, opened in Munich over the weekend. The 181st Oktoberfest started with the traditional tapping of the first beer from the first keg. As we leave you with these visuals, we wrap up. Thank you and thanks for watching this.